Welcome to Talent Matters, the podcast where talent, skills and grit take centre stage. I'm Donal O'Donoghue and this is episode 20. The podcast is sponsored by Sanderson, talent solutions that transform businesses globally. I'm delighted in this episode to be joined by John Sweetman, who has just released a brilliant new book called Identity. John spent nearly 30 years in the Irish police on Garda Síochána, a lot of that in their technical uh, investigation division, a bit CSI kind of stuff. You're very, you're very welcome, John. How are you doing, Don? Good, good. Thanks a million for coming no, in. Thanks for having me. Did anybody ever tell you you don't look like a guard? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, more so lately. I'm getting uh, a lot of uh, comments like that. But um, yeah, like over the years, as I gradually snuck in the whiskers and the tattoos <laughs> and stuff like that, I was getting. I would get the odd comment about it all right, yeah. Very good. Well, look, as we always like to do, um, for a bit of context, tell us a bit about where you're from and where you grew up. Well, I'm from uh, Scaries in North County, Dublin, born and bred. Um, I'm still living there. Um, uh, my dad was a, a farmer, so, you know, I always had ties to the land there and I was lucky enough to be able to build right beside the, the home place and stuff like that, you know. Um so not from a long, not not from a long line of uh, of uh, policing. No, or not at like all. That. Like there was, there was never anybody in in the family, in the job, like you know, in the guards, or you know, the military or anything like that. So mm. I was kind of the first, and I'll probably be the, the last, <laughs> you know. And what did you? What were you into as a kid? Uh, what did you like in school? What subjects did you like? Um, I'd say the only subject I liked was art. Mm. You know, and I was mad into art and you know, comics and illustrations and all that sort of stuff. And that's all I ever wanted to do, really, when I left school, you know. Mm. Um, I had wanted to get into, I tried to get into the National College of Art and Design and one or two other places, but um, I was still only 17 at the time. And a lot of these uh, colleges, you know, they want a fully prepared portfolio and Mm. stuff before you even attempt to get into them. And I wasn't prepared for it, like, you know, Um, so... I was lucky in that my folks got me into a, a an animation and fine art course and um, because I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to go back studying for three or four years unless it was mm. to do with art. But um, with that uh, course, uh, I was very lucky in, in that I got into a job in an animation company in, in the city centre here, um, Murakami Wolf. Mm. What were they doing? What kind of animations were they working well, on? It would have been, you know, you're just your standard classic cartoon type of stuff, no mm. computer uh, graphics or anything like that. And mm. at the time, they had the contract for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So there were a, it was a big thing, like, you know, and back in the early, this was 19, oh, about 1990 that mm. I started with them. So the turtles were massive, massive at the time. Yeah. And um, as was the animation industry in Ireland, you had Sullivan Bluth and a few other places. And, you know, it was, it was a, a boom time for the industry. Mm. So I was lucky to get in there. And uh, spent a couple of years at that and enjoyed it, made good money, you know. Um, still able to live at home, so yeah. it wasn't too bad. But, you know, after a couple of years, uh, they lost the contract for the Turtles. You know, business started drying up. Uh, it was right through the, the industry. Mm. And they had the downsize and let a load of us go. But that um, that coincided with a recruitment drive with, with the guards around that time. There was a massive push on since... Oh, the, the late 80s and well into the 90s, um, Templemore and all that had been totally revamped into a state-of-the-art college. And um, and who saw it first? Who saw the ad? Or like, were you was, aware of it or did um, someone recommend it to you? Or? It would, would have been my folks, my mum and dad would have seen it. Mm. You know, I wouldn't have been actively looking for it, you know. But um, it just happened to coincide with me losing the job in the animation company. I had me belly full of commuting in and out and stuff like that and um you know i I was able to work at home with my dad for for a couple of years um whilst you know my application for the guards was you know going through the going through the motions but um i knew and me me folks knew that there wasn't a future in the the farming for me or you know down the line if i was to have a family and stuff like that we were only a a small uh, Mm. farming concern so um yeah i applied for the guards you know Reasonably well paid, secure pension. I didn't really think about the work, you mm. know, and the fact that I'd be 
back in a uniform, which I swore I'd never do again. Yeah. Um, I said it in the book, like, you know, the day I finished my leaving cert, I still remember it. Uh, clear as day, uh, I came home from the school, took the uniform off and said, never again, never again. I'm, Little did you know, you know. Within three years, I was back in a uniform, you know. But, um, no, when, I was you, when, when you were a kid and you saw Starsky and Hutch or whatever on the TV and they're zooming around with the mm. the, the lights and sirens and stuff, did, did, did you ever think about, I'd love to do that at some um, stage or... Was it not on your radar it at all? It really wasn't on my radar. Mm. Like, And I do remember, again, I was working with my dad at the time. This uh, gentleman used to come to pick up uh, spuds and veg and stuff from us. And he was a real, he was an elderly man and old school kind of fella. And he caught me out in the yard throwing bags of spuds up onto the onto the trailer. And he says, jeez, you man to make a grand civvy guard, you know, with the old slang for the guards or whatever. But... Um, it kind of stuck in my head a bit, you know, mm. but um, yeah, like I just kept going along with it. When when the application came up, applied for it, passed the aptitude test, passed the interview, got through the medical, and then mm. you know into Temple Moor. And mm. what was that like? It was a big culture shock, you know. For one thing, I'd never lived away from home, so that was that was a big thing. Like I was okay, I was twenty. Was twenty one, but you know I was still a homebird, like you know, mm. and coming from Scaries and growing up around there and Loch Shinny and all that, I've always loved being close to the sea. Mm. And here was Temple Moor, which is practically slap bang in the middle of the country, like as far away from the sea as you could get. So it was a culture shock, and then you know, um, lots of big personalities in mm. you know. My group consisted of, you know, about 100 people. Like, you know, we were all roughly around the same age, but there was a lot of them that were a hell of a lot more uh, clued in about things than I was, you know, mm. um, and were well able to drink, mm. uh, you know, better than me, but I caught up over the years. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it was a big culture shock. And then, of course, you have all the rules and the regulations mm. and stuff like that, you know. What was the balance in the group that you were with, like, in terms of personalities? Because I think you see with any, not just the guards, but any uh, people in kind of policing roles, you get some people that, I suppose, have a genuine interest in mm. in the work. And then you have some people that are probably more into, I suppose, the some of the authority that comes with it. What, yeah. what was your group like for that kind um, of stuff? All, you know, by and large, they were a great bunch of people, like, you know, um, made some really, really good friends. Um the type of people that, you know, if you don't see them for years, when you mm. do finally catch up with them, you just pick up where you left off, yeah. you know. Um, a lot of them would have been very much sports orientated, you know, and mm. that was one thing that I, you know, I have absolutely not a single sporting bone in my body, you know. So there was a lot of, you know, really fit county footballers and all this sort of stuff. Um, then there was, you know, there was a lot of people that were very academic minded mm. and... Um, you know, some of them went on to, you know, fairly high positions within the job, like, you know, and good grafters, good workers, you know. Mm. But um, out of the hundred of, of us, I'd say there was only a handful that didn't get all the way through training, you know. Mm. Um, I don't recall, I, I can, can only recall maybe one person that left of their own accord. And then mm. you might have one or two others that would have, you know, committed some infraction or something like that and were let go before the training was finished but you know the, the, the vast majority mm. um went through the training completed it and you know they'd all be coming up to retirement now the same as me um but it's not like today when a lot of people join the guards having worked at something else for several years you know they, mm. the the age restrictions are all changed now and all that so you know, an awful lot of people might do the job for a few years nowadays and then uh, call it quits, you know. But back then, it was still pretty old school in that, you know, if you were in the guards, it was pretty much a job for, for the next 30 years or yeah. so, you know. I thought it was good seeing that, that they that they changed the age restrictions because, I know, they put the entry up to, I think, almost 50 years yeah, of age. So yeah. you actually get people with some life experience and yeah. a bit of perspective. Cause yeah, like, because going going in, in into that job, um, and, you know, I was certainly one of these type of people that, you know, I hadn't got much life experience, you know, or, or experience in dealing with people or confrontational situations and stuff like that. So 
yeah, the, like the age restriction being relaxed is a good thing, I think, because, you know, it gives people a chance to try out other things and really put some serious thought into into this job, you know, the guards before committing to it, you know. Yeah. And when you finished your training and you ended up, um, I suppose, you know, starting to be assigned to the, the couple of stations that you worked in, mm. what was the reality of actually doing the, the job mm. as, as uh, you know, I'll use the word policing because we're, we've, uh, we have people watching and listening from, you know, North America, Ireland, the UK, etc. Um, but what was the reality of actually finding yourself in the job after training compared to what you thought it might be? And how did it suit you as a person? Yeah, well, it, it, I, it didn't, well, I didn't suit it rather than it not suiting me. Um, you know, when you first come out of Templemore as a student guard, you've got no powers. So you're basically on a ride along with whoever, um, with the other members that you're with. And that, that was great, like, you know, because you'd be zooming around the place and car chases, chasing fellas, whatever. But you'd know files or paperwork or something like that, apart from what, what you had to have done for the, for your, the college, like, you know. Mm. But um, then uh, you get sworn in after whatever it is, about a year or so, and then you have your powers, like, you know, and then you're landed out into a station. Um, I was lucky, and then I suppose it was a double-edged sword, really, because I got, again, I fell on my feet and got a, a station close to home. I got Malahide, which at the time, you know, was only about 15 minutes from home. Malahide was a hell of a lot smaller then than it is now, like it practically joins onto onto swords and, you know, further. Um, but back then it was a lovely, quiet uh, station which um very little in the way of problem areas or anything like I that just gonna say very little yeah. crime over, <laughs> yeah like most of the talking, crime would be yeah. you know you'd be centered around the, the, the town on, on a weekend or something like that mm. public order stuff like yeah. nothing big which was good in in that um it was a nice place to work but then i wasn't getting much experience you know mm. apart from you know stopping fellas when they'd be taking a leak in somebody's doorway or just, you know, a bit of boisterous behaviour and a few bits and bobs. Um, it was quite quiet, you know, like you go out on a, on a week of nights, especially on a winter night, you know, and certainly for the second half, like back then we used to work 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And certainly for the, the tail end of the, the shift, you'd be trying to keep your eyes open because there'd be mm. nothing happening, like unless unless you went into one of the other nearby districts like Coolock or something like that to a bit more action to, to, Coolock, to, you know, to assist mm. at a, at a, at a incident or something like that. So it was, it was very quiet. Mm. Um, but I did like it. I liked that the, the unit I was working with were great. Um, and, um, unfortunately then, because you had to go back and do a, a final stint in Templemore before the big passing out parade and all this sort of stuff. Uh, when I went back to Templemore, um, they went down through the group and picked out five or ten, I can't remember how many of, of, of us there were, to go into the command and control um, centre in Harcourt Street, mm. which, you know, that's your call taking 999 calls and dispatching cars. Mm. So, again, I was taken out of an environment that, even though it was quiet, I could still learn there and found myself in command and control where all I was doing was answering calls and dispatching cars. So I was in there for a couple of years, um, and then by the time I came back out, and and that was hope I got sent to. By the time I came back out, I was still green around the gills, like you know, I had a couple of years service, but no real experience. Mm. And I never forget, like the first evening uh, that I arrived in Hope, um, and I was in the patrol car, and I was just like, I haven't got a, a notion of, mm. you know, you know, really what being a guard is all about, you know, okay, I can talk to people on the phone and I can talk to the cars and dispatch whatever, mm. like, you know, but when it comes to the actual nitty gritty, I had no experience and okay, like everybody has to learn, you know, mm. and, but I was, I was, um, I was lacking in self-confidence and, you know, found myself kind of shying away from any kind of confrontations and stuff like that mm. because, 
I just what well, didn't have the com- didn't have the confidence. Um, you kind you of know. touched on it a, a little bit in the book, where it, it's I don't know if it's imposter syndrome, but you kind of touched on this kind of idea that there was like the persona of of the guard or how you thought a guard was supposed to yeah. be, and then yeah, tell us a little bit about about that. Yeah, like um, like the, again, when I was in Hote, the unit I was with were great. They were really, really nice um, guys. You know, it was all guys on the unit back then. But, um, you know, I found it hard to fit in, you know. Yeah. Okay, I, I could put on the bravado and, you know, the gallows humour and all that sort of stuff and the guard to speak and all that kind of crack. But, um, you know, when it came to trying to get files together and juggling with charge sheets or going to court, which scared the, the bejesus out of me, you know. I felt that um, I was severely lacking, you know, and I couldn't understand why the rest of the guys didn't see it in me, you know. Maybe I hit it well or whatever, but uh, there was one particular gent on the unit and he he was, you know, he had a lot of service under his belt at the time. He kind of knew that I was struggling, you know, and and Mm. he did his best to... uh, you know, to try to give me a bit of a, a bit of a, a pep or pep up or whatever, you know. But um, I would have, I would have thrown in the towel. I'd say. Yeah, you didn't think it was for you. Did no, you I, I, I was seriously considering throwing in the towel, and you know, I hadn't mentioned it to anybody. I hadn't mentioned it to to me folks or the girlfriend or anything. And um, you know, I just, I didn't want to let anybody down. Mm. You know, I, I know, it, I know they wouldn't have minded. Like they would have mm. just wanted me to be happy, but. At the same time, I felt that, you know, I had almost wasted a few years when I could have been doing something, you know, maybe I could have got back into the art bit mm. or whatever. Um, so I was really at, at, at a, a make or break decision until, you know, the technical bureau kind of dropped out of the sky for me one day. Yeah, how, uh, how did that happen? Yeah, well, again, like, as, as I said in the book, um, like one man's misfortune is another man's, you know, good luck. Um, and a publican in Hoth uh, got assaulted in the in the pub one night. A fellow glassed him with a with a pint glass. And uh, the member I was telling you about that was looking out for me on the unit, he was you know investigating it, and he he took possession of the pint glass and decided to bring it into uh, the fingerprint section in Garda headquarters to see if he could get the culprit's marks on the glass you know and i went along with him for for the for the trip into hq one night when things were quiet you know and it really opened my eyes like i I had never even considered that um this place existed you know and like a lot of things in the guards back then i had a picture in my mind of decrepit you know musty old offices and stuff like that which was the case back when they were they used to be in a place down on john's road near houston station but they were in the 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 newer building in in um, Phoenix Park at the, by this stage, and the whole section had been revamped and everything, like you know. So you had big, wide open offices, air conditioning, computers, you know, scanning on cameras and all this sort of stuff, and um, a dedicated, you know, chemical development section for where you'd examine exhibits and stuff like that for fingerprints. And, you know, I was just in awe, like, that this place exists and it's staffed exclusively by guards, you know. Mm. And I was like, how the hell do you get in to these things, you know? Because um, like anything in the guards and, and most jobs, you have to wait for vacancies to arise and then they have to be they have to be advertised, you know. But, um, you know, as I said, I was lacking in confidence and stuff like that, but I was cute enough to get my foot in the door and bend the ear of one of the sergeants in the fingerprint section to say, this is brilliant, like, you know, and I kept in touch with him um, over the next couple of months. And um, he was he was telling me that there should be vacancies coming up, you know. So as soon as the vacancies did come up, I jumped at it. And mm. um, uh, myself and another guy that I'd worked in command and control with uh, were lucky enough to, to get accepted in, into, um, into the section. So... You know, that was nine months after I went to Hout and I was off again, but this time into the Bureau. Mm. So all told, uh, as a as a fully fledged uniformed guard, I really only had 18 months mm. out there. Like I had whatever period of time I'd spent in Malahide and then in um, Hout. You know, that was just a short period of time uh, to be out on the streets. 
And but the way I looked at it and the way I sold it in the interview was that, OK, I've only got so many years service, but I've got so many more years service left to give, mm. you know, and, you know, I had no intention of messing it up. This was going to be for me, you know. And it's interesting as well, isn't it? Because there's a couple <clears> of things that that tie into this, like interest is one of the key things that determines how successful somebody is going to be mm. in something. Like I always think if you're really interested in something and you submerge yourself in it, you learn everything there is to learn. You have that hunger and that appetite. Yeah. And it's interesting that, you know, you had the the foresight or the insight to say, look, the 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 policing on on the on the beat for want of a better for want of a better way of putting it maybe didn't suit you but mm. this level of analysis kind of ties into yeah. the investigation the artistic background mm. the eye for detail it's, it's funny yeah. how things like that can kind of tie yeah. together like i think the the the, the like you said the, the the detailed aspect of the work and it tied into the you know the skills that I had, having worked in the animation industry and stuff like that. Like I was able to, you know, fully commit to something, concentrate on it, zone out whatever was going on around me and stuff like that. You know, and it, and I had a good eye for for detail. Mm. So it really, uh, uh, it it really suited me, and I suited it. You mm. know. When you think about your time in the fingerprint section, what what uh, which of the of the cases that you investigated kind of comes to mind as as one of the ones you're you're kind of proud of um yeah well like, like you know anytime you get an ident on something i'd be proud of it or you'd get a buzz out of it you know um the fingerprint section like the other sections within the bureau the ballistics uh, photography and mapping and all that at the time we were designated as part of the national support services so we were a support uh to Guardy investigating crime so um that was like you know that was your duty was to do as much as you could to assist in an investigation if there was evidence there you know fingerprint evidence in my case <clears throat> if it could be you know uh found and identified you know then you were doing something good for the investigating guardy but um yeah like i'm, I'm I always remember like the first murder I was involved with, even though at the time I was still training as a fingerprint expert. So I went along as a, as an assistant to um, another expert that was on the job. Um, and I did that. I did that for a good while before I went out on my own. But um, <clears throat> that was a murder back in Finglas in 1998. It was an elderly lady called uh, Marie Dillon was murdered in her um in the little garage beside our house and it was unusual in that it was a complete who done it you know and complete who done it's a very rare especially nowadays but even back then like that was um it was a rarity because most murders or suspicious deaths or something like that if there's a if there's somebody responsible is more often than not somebody known to the victim be it a partner be it a, you know a family member or something like that but this this lady lived on her own and there was just really no suspects at all like you know and um we were lucky enough to retrieve some finger marks made in blood and it was the the victim's blood from the scene um her car had been parked in the garage and there was finger marks left on the bonnet of the car she she had been killed and fell down behind the car so you know these marks made in blood that weren't hers they had to be culprits marks you know and um so myself and and the chap i was assisting did what we had to do go through the motions in in getting the mark recorded you know photographed then lifting it or you know uh trying to, you know, capture all the detail in it and stuff like that. And then it was searched on the AFIS system, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, which, you know, had been installed in about 1996. So it was, it was a new enough system and it was state-of-the-art for what it did. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't identify things for you. You still have to input, you know, input the finger marks into the system, mark up all the little details within, within the, the finger mark, and then it will bring back... 30 or more respondents that it thinks are a close match but <clears throat> excuse me it's up to the the examiner to make that call so um we put the mark into the system and it, it came back with with a, a respondent anyway you know and then 
the identification or the verification is done off the actual set of fingerprints. It's not done on the computer. So, and uh, all right. So the, what the set that exists on the on the system mm -hmm. give you an indication, but then you've you've got to do yeah, you've got to you take a to fresh set from from, well, from the respondent, or how does that work? Yeah, like. It can be a bit convoluted sometimes, but the the AFA system is tied into the national collection, the national fingerprint collection. So mm. it has images of all the sets of fingerprints that are stored within the fingerprint section. These are the hard copies on the pieces of paper, like, you know, and you could have, you know, you could have a person fingerprinted many times, but they'd all be filed together and stuff like that. Um, so... The identification then, if the computer throws something up and, and the examiner thinks, yeah, that's that's looking good, the identification is only made from a hard copy, you know, an actual piece of paper with the inked set of pr prints on them. Gotcha. And, you know, then, you know, the ideal situation after that would be that if an identification is made and a suspect is arrested, then a fresh set is taken. Mm. And that's the set that you use going to court. And mm. that's done because... Um, you have to be very careful in court um, with regards to people's possible previous convictions and stuff like that. You, mm -hmm. you can't be saying that, well, I identified it off of a set of fingerprints that were was taken in Mount Joy when he was in for this, that, neuter. You can't say mm -hmm. that because it's prejudicial uh, mm -hmm. to the accused. So a fresh set of prints is taken and then another identification is made off of that. And that's the one then that's used to present the evidence in court, you know. Yeah. So... You know, this, this uh, finger mark from, from the murder scene hit against a set of fingerprints. There was only one set on for this young lad. Um, he was only 17 at the time. Richard Kearney was his name. And um, it like that, it was just out of the blue. Like, I mean, he would never have, uh, he would never have come on the radar at all. Like, there was no CCTV. There was no suspects. There was, there was nothing else. Mm. And, um, you know, when we had the information about the identification, that would have been... Um, conveyed to the investigation team and then they arranged to you know lift them the following morning early in the morning but um we only found out afterwards that the young lad had only been fingerprinted recently just prior to the murder um there was a guard i think it was in whitehall guard station had him in for <clears throat> the theft of a leather jacket or something you know mm. and he was just about to let him out after summonsing him or whatever and he just thought jeez i might as well print this fellow while he's here and he printed him, like, you know, and if he hadn't have printed him, he wouldn't have been on the system. Mm. And if he kept his nose clean and never got printed, he might, he might never have been got, you know. Mm. Um, and what did they learn about after he was, um, you know, arrested? And stuff? Did, did, they, did they find out the context of what had happened? Um, again, like, we, I would have been somewhat removed from that part of it. Like, mm. you know, once we had gotten the identification... Mm -hmm. It's kind of job done. And that's job done until it comes to present it at court, you know. Mm. So from what I recall, he said he was in the garage to steal the radio out of the car or something, right. you know. Yeah. But, you know, I, I reckon there was something more to it than that because the, the, the level of ferocity mm. that the, the, the beating was, like, you know, the lady was severely beaten, you mm. know, and... Um, I reckon there was, you know, something more to it than that, mm -hmm. but you know, it 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 was never it was never fully understood. Mm -hmm. Like you know, they had their man. Like, um, but yeah, like that. And say that was my first job out on a murder scene. It always stuck in my head. Um, and then you know, a couple of years later, when I had passed the experts courses and stuff like that for for uh, fingerprints, then I started going out on my own. You know, and they're not all murders and suspicious deaths and big drug seizures. Like very often you could be just going to burglaries or, you know, um, drug, you know, small drug seizures, stuff like that. Anything that, um, say the local superintendent in whatever area it is, if he deems it necessary for a bureau team to come, then he would, you know, request the bureau team because otherwise any scenes of crime work would be carried out by local scenes of crime officers. But, in the in serious crimes like murders and stuff like that, more often than not, it would be a job for the the bureau to come out and mm. um, fully process it. You know, so there was a long period of time when you were in that role in the bureau where you would have attended a lot of pretty mm. gruesome yeah. crime scenes. Yeah. Um, 
without going into to too much detail, you've probably seen, well, you've definitely seen things that most of us will never see and never want to see. Mm. How, how did you manage that? Because you were, you were a young man at the yeah. time. Not that you're not, you're still yeah. a relatively young man. I think we're of a similar yeah. vintage. But um, yeah, I, and I always, I always think about that, whether it's, you know, policing or the ambulance services, you know, there's, there's a level of things that you see that, and then you've got to go home to life and to your partner and to mm. your family. And so tell us a little bit about how you manage that. Yeah, well, it's the type of job and the stuff you get exposed to. You, you find out very quick if it suits you or not. Like, you know, I've seen people come and go quite quickly within the Bureau for various reasons, but like sometimes it, that aspect of the work just doesn't, you know, suit people or whatever. But, and I'm sure it's the same in, like you say, like with, with ambulance people and paramedics and all that sort of stuff. Um, you very quickly become used to it. You know, you don't, you don't become used to it. Like, like you're not blasé about it and you're not kind of, you know, uh, nonchalant about it or whatever uh, the case may be. But when you're, when you go to these scenes, there's the initial shock to the senses, you know, the sights, the smells, mm. you know, particularly the smells sometimes, but, um, you very quickly switch into, um, into a business mode you know, that you're there for a job, you're there for a purpose. And like anybody else that's there on the team or the investigating guard, the pathologist, stuff like that, you're there for a purpose. And that's to, you know, gather evidence in, in, to assist in the investigation of, of whatever crime it may have been. So you do get, get used to it. You get used to the routine of it because although every scene is different, if you're dealing with, you know, uh, scene with a body there like you know there's procedures where you know the photographer's always the first person in record everything in situ before anything is looked at or moved or anything like that uh pathologist comes uh to you know examine the body in situ and all that sort of stuff and then arrangements as you are usually made for the body to be removed uh for post-mortem and then you get in to work at the scene. So you're, you're busy, you know, you're busy all the time, you know, so you get over the initial boom of it quite quickly. And then you're thinking about, well, what way am I going to go about this? Like there's either, there's not much here for me or there's a ton of stuff here for me or whatever it is. So you get used to it, you know, you get used to it quite quick and everybody else by and large uh, on, on the team and, you know, I've worked with many different uh, experts in all of the sections over the years. They're of the same mind, like, you know, that we're here to get the job done. And I don't mean we go around all stony faced and, and uh, you know, deadly serious all the time, but we just get down to it, you know. And um, you just, you don't really have time to process it too much. And I, I never, I never really brought it home mm. with me, you know, like when I left, when I take the white suit off or whatever the case may be and you know, get home, usually maybe after I've been away for a couple of days on, on some job, um, you just park it, mm. you know, and back... Was, wasn't the topic a dinner table no, conversation? No, like not really, no, mm. not really. Like, you know, the, the first couple of times, you know, the, uh, my family or, or my wife would be interested in what was going down, but then after that it becomes, you know, pretty mm. much, just give them the bones of it, like they don't need to know any any of the really nasty details and um yeah you just get used to it um and back when i started in the bureau there wasn't any counseling services or anything like that mm. um unless there was some really 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 horrific scene that you came across but um you know over the years all of that came into the job you know and it was always there for you. And, you know, in, in cert some cases, it was almost mandatory that if you had been on a particularly mm. bad job that you had to go and, you know, have a chat with somebody about it just to say that, you know, you're okay. And, you know, the, the, all the, the, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted that we're looking after our, our members, you know, mm. um, you know, it never, it never got to me. I've seen people where, you know, it has, it had got to them, uh, like, you know, just th that final straw. Mm. But, 
you know, the job looked after them. They got great supports and they were able to recover and get back to doing the job again, you know. Yeah. Because it is the type of thing that although there can be nasty aspects to the work, it's fascinating stuff, though. Like, mm. It's really interesting, you know. And um, certainly for me, like back in, in the days when I was in fingerprints and I was still quite young, you know, nearly anybody else in the guards of my age or my service would never get inside the tape at a crime scene. They might be outside taking the names of the people going in, but here mm. I was, like, you know, I was still only a few years in the job and I was going in there, you know, into mm. these things and learning stuff, like uh, learning stuff from the others, you know, with, you know, more experience and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and just, actually, you, in, in the book, you go into a good bit of detail on the technicalities of fingerprinting and mm. the science behind it and all that, which is, again, it's it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, but and, and even the level of training. That the training was fantastic. Was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, we got, obviously, we got constant on-the-job training. And, it, you know, going to scenes is only a small part of it. Like, the bulk of, you know, the job is sitting at a desk or sitting at a computer screen looking at fingerprints, you know. But you have to get used used to it and and um, learn about it and learn about you know the elasticity of the skin and you know um, all the different types of fingerprint patterns, the important details, stuff like that. You know, and like we even touched on some of the old um, classification methods for fingerprints back before there was computers and stuff. Everything was classified under a numeric system that was incredibly convoluted, but it was actually it was very good at you know, classifying fingerprints into, into certain groups. The only problem was that when you went to go to search um, a crime scene, Mark, you were you were going manually through all this stuff, whereas the computer cut that out of it, like, you know. Mm. Um, so the, the, the big uh, advantage of having the computerized system was that it, it, it speeded it up, mm. you know. Um, it didn't make it any better or any worse. It just made it more efficient. But, yeah, the training was fantastic, like... Um, say a lot of on the job training and then back then we were sent to the UK a couple of times for intermediate and expert courses and you know they would be sharpening your skills really to, to the best that you could be and also uh, which I thought was fantastic at the time um, on the fingerprint experts course it was three weeks of almost constant courtroom um, practice mm. you know which you know as I said earlier when I started out in the job court scared the, the life out of me because you know trying to keep track of what's going on and stuff like that okay when you're in a specialized area like in in fingerprints or uh ballistics or whatever case may be and when you go to court you're just given evidence on that field so you're not worrying about arrest charge and caution custody records witnesses all this sort of stuff you're just there to talk about your particular uh part in the investigation but court was still, you know, quite daunting. But, you know, three weeks of daily courtroom practicals in, in the UK and you were being examined by other experts. So you couldn't bullshit them like, you know, mm. and in the UK, it's different than, than it is here. You stand up in the witness box. You're not sitting down there or hiding behind the, the lectern or whatever it is. You know, you have to stand up there. So you're just totally exposed. So, you know, when, when myself and my colleague, Alan, that went with me on that course, when we came back from that, we were as sharp as we were going to get. Like, you know, mm. it was great. And it really boosts your confidence, really, really boosts your confidence in that, you know, it, you never become, you know, totally relaxed about court. You have to be, you have to be always somewhat nervous or on edge, but you don't know what way things are going to go. So you, but you have to be, able to you not it's not just about being able to speak and sell the evidence which is very important but you also have to know when when to say nothing like you know mm. or you know like there's a good defense counselor that will will try to tie you in knots if you mm. let them so um the the courtroom stuff was just fantastic for for building that confidence you know and being able to project what can be com a complicated uh uh subject you know fingerprints or maybe later in later years handwriting what can be complicated stuff but presenting it in such a way that a lay person or a juror or the judge or whatever can understand it you know mm. 
But yeah, the training was fantastic. And you touched on the handwriting and documents parts. So you, mo- you moved within the yeah. bureau to, to yeah. a different section. So tell us a little about, about documents and handwriting. What, yeah. what's, uh, what was involved there? Well, after I was 10 years in fingerprints and, you know, I had become an expert after five years in fingerprints and I was still only 30 at the time and I still had, you know, 16, 17, 18 years minimum left to do in the job. And as much as I liked it, I loved the fingerprint section, I I couldn't see myself staying there for the whole way through my service. You know, I I said to myself, I'll get burnt out on this or I lose interest in it or something. And I didn't want that to happen. So um, the documents and handwriting section was also part of the technical bureau. But um, again, it would have involved detailed comparative work and stuff like that. So it it appealed to me from that respect, particularly the handwriting aspect of it. Um, so, you know, I, when a vacancy applied, again, I was foot in the door. They were only a floor down from where we were in the fingerprint section. Uh, I knew that there was a vacancy coming up and went for it and was lucky enough uh, again to to get into it, you know. So in that section, <clears throat> um, pretty much all office space, there would be very little in the way of crime scene college and stuff like that. So that aspect of, of my career was, was more or less finished. But, um, you know, that section dealt with primarily, you know, two disciplines you had security documents so anything that could be you know counterfeited or stuff like that either for a monetary gain or you know if somebody wanted to hide travel history or wanted to be able to travel and stuff like that so you'd be talking about passports money motor tax discs um insurance discs all you know driving licenses anything that has you know some kind of value be it monetary or be be it you know, enabling travel or whatever the case may be. Um, so you'd be examining any question documents like those that would come in. And all of these documents would have certain security features in them. So you had to learn about printing techniques and the, you know, the processes involved with putting in, you know, say like ultraviolet safeguards, watermarks, microprint, all these things into secure documents and being able to determine whether the document uh, that's in question is genuine or if it's counterfeit or if it's been altered or something like that, you know. So, you know, again, there was a lot of training involved in that over to the Netherlands a few times uh, on, you know, uh, be, you'd be going to learning about printing and stuff like that. It, it can be very technical because you have all different types of printing, in, inkjet, offset, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then the other aspect, which was the one that really appealed to me, was was uh, handwriting examination. And um, so anytime there's, you know, a question piece of handwriting, be it a, you know, a threatening letter or anonymous letter or signatures on, say, checks or any anything like, like that, you know, involving signatures and handwriting that uh, were in question would come in to be examined. But, you know, they always had to have... Be or, or be accompanied by uh, genuine specimens of the the supposed authors. So it would be the examiner's job then to determine whether or not the questioned writing was written by the person who wrote the specimens. So again, it w- it was similar to fingerprints in that you were giving ident- identification evidence, but unlike fingerprints, uh, it's not standalone evidence. You know, like fingerprints is on its own, without any other supporting evidence, is, you know, uh, suffice to give as an evidence of identification. Um, but, you know, handwriting identification uh, would be, you know, usually there'd be some other supportive evidence or whatever. Mm. But what appealed to me about it was you had to sell it that bit more because, like, you know, everybody's fingerprints are different and that's taken as a given and every time a fingerprint expert gives evidence on an identification they're only you know they're only rubber stamping that you know that remark that all fingerprints are unique but uh, handwriting because there's so many more very variables involved Mm. like you'll never write the same way twice like like, okay you have no two people will write the same way twice but no one writer will ever write exactly the same way twice because we're not machines and You know, again, there's so many variables involved, like posture, writing implement, writing surface, 
you know, if you're under the influence of an intoxicant, whatnot, all of these variables come into play. So it was much more of a, a, a sort of evidence that you really had to sell it, like, mm-hmm. you know. Um, now, you did have a safety net there in that there was levels of opinion, levels of certainty and stuff like that. But that that would mainly be reliant on, you know, the amount of material you had available to you. So if you had reams of question paper and or question writing and tons of specimen writing, you know, you could arrive at a very strong opinion. Mm. Or if you only had a small piece of writing or a simplistic signature, something like that, you know, you'd be limited in what you could say with regards to authorship, you know. Yeah. But um, I found it great. I found it fascinating, like, you know, and, and even more so than the fingerprints, uh, you could really sink yourself into it, mm-hmm. you know. And most of the handwriting cases that I, I've dealt with over the years are on the lesser scale of offences, like you'd be talking about, you know, social welfare fraud, question anonymous letters, nuisance letters, stuff like that. Dodgy checks. Dodgy checks, stuff like that that wouldn't... They go to court, okay, but you wouldn't hear about them or anything like that. But they were still f- fascinating to me. Like you know, if the material was there, if there was enough quality and quantity of it, mm. um, that you could come to some kind of conclusion. I always, I loved those cases. Like you know, mm. um, okay, you would come across the odd time more serious cases involving uh, question handwriting and signatures. Um, but uh, for the most part, like, they were more mundane stuff, you know, mm. but it, it didn't matter to me, you know, what I was examining. You'd still give it the same, yeah, the same level of uh, attention, you know. Yeah, there's one, there's one fascinating story in the book uh, where it, it almost reminded me of the movie Minority Report where the crime was almost solved before before right, it happened. Yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if we want to talk. I think people should actually get the book to to hear yeah, that story. Yeah. But uh, that was a that was a fascinating one. Yeah, like without going into into it much, it it was just one of these things that um, it kind of snowballed because at the time I was examining nearly most of, if not all, of the handwriting that was coming into the section. But, most of it. Um, so when I came across, uh, what I initially came across, two cases that, you know, appeared to have, to my eye, been written by the same author. Um, and it, it, it's, you know, it went on from there and, you know, it, it went on over a couple of years and massive amounts of writing involved. Mm. Um, but as I say, it's, it's, it's in the book. Like, you know, it was a very interesting one to be involved in in that um, even when I was getting my notes together and, and researching for the book, I couldn't find any reference to 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 it in, in the media, like in the press or anything like that. And I knew I knew it had been in, in the media. It had to be because um, uh, the individual had involved and it had been named. But even at that stage, like, I couldn't find anything like it was only one of the one of the guard members that had been involved in the investigation was able to dig up something for me. So I was able to say, yeah, I wasn't imagining all this. Yeah, mm. it did happen, you know, and some of the details because I had gone back a couple of years ago. I was in my head. I was kind of saying, was it really that, you know, involved? Was it really that fucking serious? And it mm. was like, you know, mm. but um, yeah, like it's just it was just one of those things that just became a, a, a bigger concern over time. Mm. Um, but yeah, like some, some of the handwriting cases uh, can be very interesting in, in that regard, in that, okay, you're there just to, to do a job in, in giving an opinion as to whether somebody wrote something. Mm. But there can be a whole backstory behind it, like, you know, that make, can make it very, very interesting, you know. Mm. Um, and like that, even more so than fingerprints and stuff like that, every single handwriting case is different because everybody writes differently and everybody writes differently depending on numerous circumstances. So it was never a case that I'd be, oh, not another one of these things. I'd be, okay, it's another signature case or it's another whatever. They were still different, like, you know. Mm. Um, Some of the stuff was interesting as well with the, what, what do you call it, the indents where somebody may have written yeah. a note and it... 
You yeah. mightn't have the note, but you might have the, yeah, the, the like, indent. That's um, the indent, indentations left after somebody writes. So, like, you know, if you have a sheet of paper that you write on, the theory being that if you write on that, there'll be indentations coming through to subsequent pages. Now, I don't mean heavy things that you can see when you hold it up to the light. You, these would be totally invisible. So um, what's used then in those cases would be a piece of equipment that we call the ESDA, Electrostatic Development Apparatus. So, you know, you... you it's you know you have to charge the paper with an electrical charge and cover it with a special kind of cling film a mylar film and apply a toner to it and stuff like that and the the theory being that any indentations that might be present there um can be developed using the toner because of you know no nobody really knows with 100 percent accuracy how it works but it works like you know it's to do with the distribution of the charge the electrical charge in the paper depending on you know the fibers and if they've been compressed and stuff like that but it can bring up uh, fantastic very clear indentations of what may have been written on previous pages and that type of evidence is great because it it, it doesn't need any exp explain explaining okay you explain the process but the actual finished product you can hold it up and say well this is what came up and if it's legible and readable that's mm. the evidence, you know, yeah. and 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 I mentioned it in the book. Um, um, one of the most high profile uses of, of the ESDA there in, in recent years was in that um, uh, the Patrick Quirk tri trial, uh, uh, the Mister Moonlight murder. Mm. Um, a colleague of mine examined uh, pages found in the suspect's house and developed some pretty, you know, pretty interesting indentations mm. from from. Uh, pages that he'd written previous material on and that was you know it was although it was only a very small part of the um the investigation like that was a massive investigation and the longest i think it was the longest criminal trial to date in the state but mm. that small little piece of evidence carried carried a lot of weight with the jury you mm. know um because it was so simple it was unambiguous it can't be yeah. argued you know yeah and you know, a, a, we I spent an awful long time, especially in my first uh, couple of years within the documents and handwriting section, solely doing them those as the cases. You know, and okay, mm -hmm. nine times out of ten, you mightn't get anything, or you might get so much indentations from previous pages that it's it's all jumbled up and you can't make head nor tail mm -hmm. out of it. But occasionally, you'd come across something, and it could be a mundane enough case. Like I remember one case there with um. It was a nuisance letter or a threatening letter or something like that. And I treated the letter and up came beautiful indentations of a name and address where the writer had written a letter prior to the nasty one and had filled out all his details on it. So, OK, they were able to, say, zone in on a suspect. But when they went to search or went to confront him, they found like a cannabis grow house in, the, in, in his house. And they wouldn't have gone there and went without the information that had been garnered from from the indentations you know so sometimes it can lead on to other things like you know but it, it is great type uh, that type of evidence because it is unambiguous it's just mm. there you go like you know when when did the idea to write the book come up was it did people used to say it to you as you as, as you were going through the career yeah. or when when did it kind of come on on yeah your, uh, well, I always wanted to write, um, always wanted to write. And, you know, I'd always be making jokes and work, especially over the last few years of, of my service. Um, like many seasoned mules, or as, as we refer to ourselves, you get a certain level of cynicism or sarcasm in you, you know, and I was uh, no different than anybody else in that regard. Like I always said that, you know, if I was having a particularly bad day, you know, with management or something like that i'd say christ i'm going to make i'm going to write my manifesto now when i get out of here or whatever you know so um i never gave it any serious thought until i was uh it was only about a year ago and i was out i had been out sick for for a good while um mental health problems which again i talk about in the book and you know i've always been up up front about it you know i've had depression on and off most of my adult life but I had been out sick for a good while and um, there had been a lot of changes within the structure of the job, within within the Bureau. The Bureau, the Guarded Technical Bureau, essentially ceased to be at the end of 2019 because it was merged with Forensic Science Ireland. So 
uh, those of us that were still there were seconded into Forensic Science Ireland, which, you know, is mostly staffed by civilians, you know, so it was a big culture shock for us, um, you know, and uh, of course that necessitates changes in management and whatnot. An ISO, you touched on the ISO. Oh, ISO. We'll, we'll leave that yeah, one there. No, don't go into the <laughs> ISO. Um, but ISO, com new computer systems, mm. new procedures and checks and balances, all of that sort of stuff, coupled with the fact that I had been out sick. Um, and uh, I, I knew I wasn't in a position to go back to work, but I had I was kind of facing, you know, the, I was facing the clock with it. I, I, I was pay affected, but... You know, I knew I couldn't go back. I only had seven, I think seven months left to do until I'd got to me 30 years, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I had hoped to to get out on a medical discharge. Didn't happen. So I took the decision to, to um, jump ship, you know, a few months early, which affected my pension and affected um, any gratuity payment and stuff like that. But it was the right decision for me. I don't regret doing it, you know. And... Mm. That was in that was at the end of September, uh, twenty twenty three, and I don't know what it was. One day I just I picked up a, a a writing pad and I started writing, and it was from day one, or say the day I come home Old from school. school. Yeah, yeah, actually, a write well with a, with a with a pen. With a pen, no, I quickly as a handwriting expert, yeah. you probably have to. <laughs> well, I quickly um, jettisoned that idea after after a while because it was just too. You know, it was just too long-winded. But I started from that day when I came home from school and I took the uniform off. Mm. And I went from that. I was lucky in that I had diaries for a lot of these going back years, you know. And then I would have had my garden notebooks and my scenes of crime notebooks and stuff like that. And, you know, I, and I remember, I remember nearly everything, you know. I remember every little thing, silly things, like, you know, from my first day in Templemore and stuff like that. And I said to myself, maybe, you know, maybe there's an interesting story in this. But what I really wanted to do was to explain the job, you know, explain the technical stuff, the fingerprints, the handwriting, all that sort of bit, but also explain what it's like, you know, or what I found it to be like uh, as a young lad in the guards, you know, and the type of, I touch on the type of culture and stuff like that and the guard to speak and, the, mm. you know, the type of humour and stuff like that. And, you know, I There's want some very funny bits in there. We won't we won't give it away for people that are about to buy it. But I love the Tom Jones bit. Oh, oh, yeah, is, yeah, well, that was that was that was a big thing back in, in, when we were training. But, you know, the guards are normal people and mm. they like to have a laugh like anybody else, you know. And they're, you know, because of the nature of the work they do, they probably party harder than most. Mm. But I wanted to get some of that across as well as what I had always found fascinating about the parts that I was involved in. And some of the jobs that I was on, like I was only on a fraction of jobs that some of my colleagues had gone to. You know, it was just the look of the draw if a job came in, if you were available or if you were off or you were in court or something like that. But, you know, I wanted I wanted to be able to write something that, say, a colleague in the section would be able to pick up and go, yeah, that's kind of like what it's like, you know. But also, again, for somebody with no connection to the guards to be able to be interested in it, you know, mm -hmm. because... You know, I know CSI and true crime and stuff like that. It is, you know, it's it's a big business or whatever, and a lot of it is, you know, based on fact and true to life. But you know, it might gloss over certain things or oversimplify simplify certain things. But you know, there's a hell of a lot of stuff that goes into uh, crime investigation, a crime scene investigation. And again, as I say, people like myself and that we're only a very small part of that. Like the work that the dedicated on the ground guards do in these cases is astronomical. But um, I wanted to be able to write about the little part that I played in it. Mm. You know, It's a nice way to close the chapter as yeah. well, isn't it? That you kind of take that almost a lifetime's worth of yeah. work and, and document it. And, and, and Yeah, like it just, it all came together at the right time because I, I'd put my papers in to retire. This idea was in my head. You know, it was the end of, you know, a huge part of my life. And I said, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. Mm. And I was just amazed that nobody else had done it. Like, mm. I've worked with so many people over the years, and they had some incredible stories and experiences to tell. And I was amazed that none of them have, have done it. Now, there have been plenty of guard mm. books, but I mean, more more from the investigative uh, type of uh, end of things, like Pat Murray's books, he's a new one out himself now, and, and 
incredibly interested, you know, but there had been none about the forensic aspect of things mm. that I could uh, recall. So, yeah, like it just, it nearly wrote itself then. Yeah, you know? no, it's brilliant. The reason I found it was I love reading and I leave, mm. and, but I only read nonfiction, I would say 95% of the time. Um, and it just, it must have just come out and my partner Leanne saw it and she said, look, this one looks like something you'd really enjoy. And I read it over a weekend, couldn't put it down. So genuinely, um, that's why I got in touch with you. Mm. And I, I want to thank you so much no, because it, it is a brilliant read. Thank you very and much. And I really appreciate you coming in and sharing the story. Not at all. Um, but I think we'll add a link to where the book can be purchased into the show notes. Um, so just a huge thank you uh, for coming in thanks a million Don. and if you've enjoyed the podcast you can follow our Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube it's at talentmatters underscore podcast and thanks again John and we'll see you next time <laughs>